And you can uh, open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. It is uh, great, great to be with you tonight to look at this book together. It's great to see uh, so many students in the room. I feel like we should, uh, like we do on the other side of the hall, we should uh, start with a game maybe, but we won't, we won't do that tonight. But thank you for being here. We're going to be looking at the, uh, the book of Proverbs tonight in this 66 book series. And as we uh, look at the book of Proverbs, I want you to consider this question as I start. What is the most valuable possession that you own? What's the most valuable thing, valuable possession in your house? You know, most of us might think about a a car being the most expensive thing we own. But but what one thing is maybe the hardest to replace? If your house caught fire, what would you grab? What would be the first thing that you grab? What would be the hardest thing to live without? Maybe it's a jewelry, maybe it's a a family heirloom, you know, maybe a piece of memorabilia from a a deceased family member that's irreplaceable. And I think it's it's helpful to to consider this question because it gives us a category for a, a priceless possession, something that's irreplaceable, something that we we can't live without, that would be the hardest to replace. And as we open the book of Proverbs, I want us to think about wisdom that way. That's how Solomon treats wisdom, as this valuable possession, this most valuable thing, which you should prize above all other things that you own. And he talks about wisdom more than just a possession, more than just an object, but it is actually a map, a tool to navigate life, something that you take with you, something that gives you answers for all of life. My wife gives me a hard time because I, I use Apple Maps for everything. Uh, I can't get anywhere without Apple Maps. Even if we've been to someone's house a couple of times, I still pull out the map and she'll make fun of me a little bit. Really? You, you don't remember? But, but to me, this, this, this tool on our phone, uh, this priceless tool for me to, to navigate, I can't remember. I, I've asked, like, how did people get around before they had maps on their phone? You know, I started driving in the days of MapQuest. You had to print out, you know, the 18 pages of directions. But to have this, this tool on your phone that you can carry with you to navigate, to tell you which direction to go, this is, this is wisdom, God's wisdom, this map for all of life. It tells you where to go, it tells you the, the right decisions for every situation in life, the right direction. So we're going to look at God's wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And the goal tonight, pretty simple goal, that you would walk away more convinced that wisdom is indeed your most valuable possession, that you would walk away treasuring, holding even tighter to wisdom. And if you are are new, if you're jumping in with us, uh, this is part of our uh, 66-book series. Every week we look at a a, a whole book. We're uh, about six months into this. So next week we'll be in Ecclesiastes. Last week we were in Psalms. And we find ourselves in the middle of the wisdom literature Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Solomon, and uh, I think Joel James, who was here a couple months ago, he has a a really helpful way to describe this this package of wisdom literature. He talks about Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes being a, a unit, going after a similar goal. He says Proverbs describes the way life should be, Job, how life is sometimes instead, And Ecclesiastes is the frustration we feel when we are in the middle of the instead. And tonight we're going to look at Proverbs, the way life should be. A book of uh, axioms, of truisms, these principles for life. And these principles, as you know, if you've read the book of Proverbs, they stand outside of culture and place and time. Even today we can take these principles with us uh, to make decisions. Uh, One theologian talks about the the book of Proverbs, God's wisdom. Uh, He talks about this this net that the the law, God's law and the prophets create this net. And imagine a net, and he says everything that that flows through the cracks of the net, everything that's not covered in the law and the prophets, that is wisdom. All of the the gray areas of life, taking God's law, taking the exhortation of the prophets and saying, now how do I apply these to the situations in life? How do I apply these truths to, to, tonight? As my kids ask me, hey, can I have ice cream after dinner? What's the best decision? How, how do I apply these truths to think through? Should I, should I buy this house? 
Should we rent a house? All of the big and little decisions in life, they take wisdom. And tonight we're, we're going to look at, our, my assignment is to look at the, the themes, the purposes of this book, the book of Proverbs. And it's really helpful in this book because Solomon gives us a, a purpose statement. There are some books in the Bible that make it really easy for us. If you ask, what's the purpose of this book? What's the author trying to accomplish? You think about 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church. So 1 Timothy, you have a a purpose statement. It makes it easy. Why is Paul writing this book? To to tell us how to do church. Well, here in Proverbs, we get a purpose statement right at the the front end. The first seven verses, they give us a, a purpose statement for Proverbs. They tell us what this book is all about. They tell us why we need it. They tell us how to read it. So we're going to look at tonight the first seven verses. We're going to spend some time to to give us really an overview of this whole book because that's what Solomon does in the first seven verses. And my prayer is that you would look to this book as a a counselor, as a friend to you, to to walk with you through every decision, every situation in life. So let's read the first uh, seven verses of Proverbs together. Proverbs 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel, to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And right off the bat, the first verse, we're introduced to the the author here. Really, you could say the compiler of Proverbs. We hear the the content, what this book is, this Proverbs, it's these truisms, these these sayings of wisdom. 1 Kings 4 says that Solomon spoke 3,000 Proverbs. And then we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 that that Solomon also pondered, searched out, and arranged many Proverbs. So Solomon here is is both the author, but also the compiler. As you read through Proverbs, you realize that not every proverb in here is from the mouth of Solomon. As you look at Proverbs 22, 17 and 24, 23, they talk about the sayings of wise men. Uh, You get to the end of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30 and 31 were introduced to Agur. And Lemuel, two different, uh, King Lemuel and Agur, two different prophets, if you will, that are speaking wisdom. And Proverbs 25.1 says that Proverbs was compiled, uh, the Proverbs of Solomon were compiled by Hezekiah's court, Proverbs 25.1. So we see here different, different authors, a compilation of Proverbs, but all going after the, the same goal here that, that Solomon sets out for us. And just to give you a, a high-level structure for this book, for those of you that like to have the structure to say, okay, what's the, how does this book lay out? At the, the highest level, you have Proverbs 1 through 9 as a section, uh, Proverbs 10 through 29 as a, another section, and then Proverbs 30 and 31. And Proverbs 1 through 9 is these instructions of Solomon to his son. Uh, poems, these stories that Solomon writes. And if, like me, you've, you've asked this question, you, you parents have asked this question, what are the things that I need to teach my kids in the home? What are the things that I should, I should teach my children before they leave the house? What do I need to instruct them in? Well, Proverbs 1 through 9 gives us the content here. It is Solomon speaking to his son. He's, he's compelling them. He's talking to someone who is still clearly in the home, under his instruction. And it's such a helpful section for us. I just encourage you dads to consider going through this section while your kids are still in the home at some point. I've been encouraged to do this. I mean, there's so many topics here. Topics around work ethic. Topics, topics around friends and influences. Uh, how to direct your desires. How to deal with emotions. How to make decisions. How to avoid worldly influences. For young men, there, there's a lot to deal with, with lust. The lust of the flesh. So that's the, the first section. Proverbs 1 through 9. And then you get chapters 10 through 29. All of these sayings, these wise sayings, all of the truisms, you know, what you're probably most familiar with in the book of Proverbs. The, the fool is like this and the wise man is like this. 
you know, these word pictures that give us a, a truth behind them. And then you get to Proverbs 30 and 31, really a, a separate section, these two different authors, Agar and Lemuel. Uh, you're familiar with Proverbs 31, I'm sure, the, the diligent woman. Uh, all of that in, in a, really a separate section, written differently. But all, again, going after one purpose, singular in its purpose. And Solomon tells us in verse 2, what is the purpose of this book? To know wisdom and instruction. A simple purpose right at the front end, to know wisdom. This is why Solomon writes. This is why he gives these proverbs, these wise sayings, these word pictures. All of these word pictures and these sayings and this figurative language is to teach us wisdom. God is giving wisdom for how to navigate life. And as we go through these first seven verses, I'm going to ask some questions, really questions that I think rise out of the text, Uh, the natural questions as you're reading. The the what, when, where, why of wisdom. Driving at verse 7, how do we get it? Really the heartbeat verse of Proverbs, how do we get wisdom? And again, the goal tonight is that you would walk away clinging even tighter to God's wisdom. So as we come to to verse 2, the first question that jumps out to us, what is wisdom? What is wisdom? Let's define this word together, this Hebrew word chokmah, wisdom. Uh, the word, a uh, base meaning of this word is skill. Just the, the ability to do a task well. A hokma sh- shows up the first time in the Old Testament in Exodus. And this word actually shows up as God is instructing Moses how to build the tabernacle. He, he's giving instructions on the craftsmanship that should be involved in, in this special place where God's presence is going to manifest on earth. And listen, just I'll read to you a couple verses from Exodus 31. It says that the the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom. And he goes on to say that this wisdom, the purpose of this wisdom that he has given to this man, is to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze. That he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. In this chapter, he goes on to say he's called out another man. Ohalib of the tribe of Dan, and all of those who are skillful, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded you. So Hokma here, as it first shows up in the Bible, is really just a a skill, a God-given skill for a God-given task, the task here to craft the tabernacle. And you get to Deuteronomy, this word shows up again in Deuteronomy 34, but now it's used of Joshua, and the wisdom here is not just skill for a, a craft, not just skill for building, But listen to what it says, Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. And the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So Joshua now has this wisdom, this God-empowered skill to lead the people, to, to direct them in the promised land, to make choices that adhere to what God says in his law. And as we get to Proverbs, you might zoom out a little bit, And just think about wisdom now as this skill, a skill not for making works of art, but a skill for living. The the canvas is now life itself, the the ability now to to navigate life. And we say someone is wise beyond their years, what they're saying, what what you're saying is effectively they have a, a skill for living. They're good at making decisions. They act like they're older than they are, like they've experienced more things than they've experienced. My favorite, I think most helpful definition of wisdom, just a simple definition, Uh, wisdom is a supernatural skill for supernatural living. A supernatural skill for supernatural living. Uh, This God-given skill, uh, the task, living in a way that pleases the Lord. So wisdom is, is the ability to navigate life in a fallen world. Gleason Archer defines wisdom. He says it's an ability to apply consistently that which we know to that which we have to do. To take what you know and now apply it to to what you have to do, the decisions, the situations in life. So Solomon writes this book so that you would know wisdom, that you would have this fixed standard of judgment, that you could walk into any situation in life and have the ability to know what is the best path forward a skill to decide in a moment what is the the most pleasing to the Lord decision? What is most pleasing to the Lord and how I parent? What is the most pleasing way 
the most, the most effective way to please the Lord in how we make dinner tonight, in how we instruct our children? How should I think about work and sleep and labor? Uh, to be able to determine what God has said about any issue in life, uh, to take those truths and now apply them to specific situations. This is wisdom. He says in verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction and to discern the sayings of understanding. So Solomon here is building for us also discernment. A discernment, an ability to make a determination between two options. That is discernment, to say which of these is more right. There could be a right and a wrong. Okay, there is a sin and righteousness, but it might just be a better and best. What's the better decision here? Which of these two options is the best? To be able to look at the long-term consequences of a decision. To be able to foresee the certain outcomes and say, yes, I should go in this direction. My brother, when we were growing up, he used to tell me, Kyle, you're, you're pretty book smart, but you're not very street smart. And I think what he meant, what he meant by that was, you know, you can, you can do well on a test. You could write a paper, but, but you keep making bad decisions. You can't take all that, all that book knowledge you can't take all that test knowledge and you actually don't apply it very well to life. What he's saying, I think, was, hey, you're not very wise. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to be able to apply it, to be able to use it well. Or, or my son has told me this one. He said, you may know a lot of things about an alligator. You may know how many teeth it has. You may know how long its snout is. But wisdom would tell you not to put your hand in the mouth of an alligator. To know all these facts to know all these facts about an alligator and to still get your hand bitten off. See, that would be foolish. So wisdom is not just to know the facts, but to apply them. And obviously, we all want this. We all want the ability to make wise choices. We all want the ability to, to navigate life. None of us wants to make hard choices. None of us wants to make poor choices that affect others. We don't want to look back on our life and, and regret all of these decisions. We don't want to have harmful consequences. But the goal here of wisdom is more than just giving us tools for decision-making, more than just tools for planning for the future. It's more than just, which house should I buy? We said that wisdom is a supernatural skill for supernatural living, to, to live in a way that honors the Lord. That is wisdom's goal. So that brings us to our, our second question, why do I need wisdom? Why do I need wisdom? Or, or to say it a different way, what is it for? What does wisdom accomplish? And just consider God uh, throughout Scripture. God says that his will for his people is that they be holy, that they be sanctified, that they live an upright life. So God's goal here for Proverbs, for the wisdom in Proverbs, is not different than his goal elsewhere. God is producing a, a righteous people. His goal is to make a holy people, to produce godliness, a people that love him and obey him from the heart. So verse 2, he gives us the, the immediate goal of Proverbs to know wisdom. And you get to verse 3 and now he zooms out. What's the, now what's the goal of wisdom? What is this going to accomplish in us? Why do I need this wisdom? Verse 3, to receive instruction in wise behavior. And he defines for us, what is wise behavior? Well, righteousness, justice, and equity. So God's wisdom produces a certain kind of character. You have wisdom and then there's, there's some effect in you. It makes you live wisely. It makes you make righteous decisions. Righteousness, this is right living in God's eyes. To live under God's standard, to be a law keeper. A justice, you could look at that more horizontally. To, to live with others in a, in a fair, equitable way. To live in accordance with what God says and to treat others fairly, to treat them rightly. And then equity. Equity, this is level behavior. To, to have level scales, to have a, an even path. This is another word for integrity. To not be two different versions of yourself. You're the same person at work, at school, at church. This is what it means to, to be equitable. To have integrity, that, that what you believe matches what you do. Your convictions match your conduct. So all of this, righteousness, justice, and equity, is produced by wisdom. And wisdom here, it produces more than the ability, like I said, more than the ability to make choices, but it produces the ability to honor the Lord, to live a righteous life. So you need wisdom. Why do you need it? To live a righteous life. To live in a way that honors the Lord. 
so that you would be able to take God's instruction and use it. Use it in a way that pleases him. And as we move to the third question here that comes at us in these purpose statements, the third question, who can get wisdom? Who can get wisdom? Back, back in verse 3, he said that to receive, this purpose of, of Proverbs is to receive instruction in wise behavior. So wisdom here comes through the means of instruction, through teaching, through one who is willing to listen and receive that teaching. So there's a condition here on wise living. So who can get it? Well, you have to be teachable. You have to be humble. I tell my kids this a lot. There are two ways to learn. You could learn through instruction or you could learn through mistakes. Uh, Instruction is a a better way to learn. It's the biblical way. You think about a, a toddler. Better to learn that the burner is hot through instruction of a mom than finding out by touching, by burning themselves. And as you get older, the consequences become greater. Think about a new driver. Better to learn that, hey, it's unsafe to drive that fast in a neighborhood. Better to learn by their parents' instruction than through the painful mistake of driving too fast in a neighborhood, of causing physical damage. So here, who gets wisdom? This third question. Clearly, it's the one who is willing to learn, the one who listens, the one who receives this instruction, who embraces it. It requires a certain disposition. And we have in verse 4 and 5 some specific characters, some specific ones who, who are willing to learn, who, who wisdom is available for. Look at verses 4 and 5. It's available to the naive, to the youth, and in verse 5, even to the wise. All of these have wisdom available to them. The, na- the naive, this is the, the open-minded one, the simple one, it is to have no filter on the mind. To have an open door on the mind. This is the time of year in Arizona where we often tell our kids, hey, don't leave the door open. You'll let all the cold air out. Shut the door. Well, here it's their their mind that is left open. They don't have discernment. They They don't think that their decisions really matter. They don't really care about the consequences to their actions. They don't realize all the dangers that are out there in the world. This is the naive, the simple. And this naive one, this simple one, he shows up throughout Proverbs. Uh, turn to Proverbs 7. You'll recognize this section. This, really, this tragic section where the naive shows up. Proverbs 7, look at verse 6. Starting in verse 6, Solomon says, At the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive. And I discerned among the youths, both of these characters, the naive and the youth. I saw a young man lacking sense. You could even say lacking conviction. And he's passing through the street near the corner of her house. And he takes the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. And verse 10, And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. You see the the naive here going down the path of the adulterous woman. At the end of that chapter, not knowing that where this leads to is destruction. He's, He's like an ox going to slaughter. The naive doesn't have the foresight to realize that he is going down this destructive path. He doesn't see the danger in front of him. To to modernize it a bit, he doesn't realize that going to these websites, spending this time on social media, following these people is actually leading him down this path. He doesn't realize the, the consequences for him. He doesn't realize the danger that's in front of him. And what he needs, back to Proverbs 1, what he needs is what wisdom offers. Proverbs 1.4, wisdom gives prudence to the naive. This one needs prudence. He needs foresight. He needs to look down the path and see dangers. He, he needs to see that not all roads are created equally. Not all roads lead to the same destination. Listen to Proverbs 27.12. Proverbs 27.12 says, A prudent man sees evil and hides himself, but the naive proceed and pay the penalty. The prudent there, he sees the outcome to his choices. He has foresight to understand what is out in front of him, that there are consequences to these decisions. And he makes his plans accordingly. He hides himself, whereas the naive just presses on, doesn't consider. And we talked about earlier navigating the gray areas of life, what wisdom is for for us, navigating the gray areas of life. 
And just consider where, where in the Bible, Proverbs 7, where in the Bible would it say it's sin to take this path? Don't take this path instead of this path. It doesn't tell us that directly. There's no, there's no passage you can find. What would it take for the, the naive to, to not go down that path? It would take discernment. He would have to take scriptural principles. You'd have to think about Romans 13, 14 that says, make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. That's what wisdom would, would say to him. How do I apply this principle now as I walk home tonight? To not say, oh, I have freedom in Christ. Yes, you have freedom in Christ. But what are the consequences to your actions? What are the dangers? And wisdom here calls to the simple one. It says, stop being simple. Don't be simple-minded. You need to be closed-minded. Not, not close to instruction, but, but close to bad ideas. Not open to every new idea. Not open to every new teaching. Not, not every new thought should intrigue you. And we all start as naive, but we can't stay there. And wisdom not only offers herself to the naive, but also to the youth, to the young, to the inexperienced, to the novice. And look what wisdom has for the youth. To the youth, verse 4, knowledge and discretion. We talked about discretion, this discernment, the ability to decide between two choices. A skill in decision making. So wisdom gives the youth discretion, discernment. I mean, this is what we're going after in parenting. Trying to help our kids build their own convictions so they can navigate life. So they have discretion as they are faced with choices in life. You know, in the home, we're helping them make choices, giving them more freedom and more freedom so they can make choices. Sometimes you have to rein those back in. Hey, you're not able to make these choices wisely right now. I'm going to help you. I'm going to make those for you. But the goal is that they would leave the house with the ability to make choices on their own, to have discernment. That's what we're training our kids to do. And the, implied in this discussion of discernment, implied in this discussion of navigating the choices of life, is this reality that, that our choices have consequences, that our decisions have consequences. That, that not every decision is going to lead to a positive outcome, that, that we can actually make destructive decisions. Or, or to say it simply, this basic, we're talking about the themes, looking at the book of Proverbs. What's the theme in the book of Proverbs? That actions have consequences. Your decisions, what you decide to do, there are consequences. That is, a fundamental, that is a fundamental principle in the book of Proverbs. Actions have consequences. That is foundational for parenting. This is what we're teaching our kids. Your actions have consequences. When we discipline our kids, that's what we're training them. You have made a mistake. There is a consequence to your action. And there are life and death implications for this. Just consider the, the gospel message. The gospel message starts with this truth, that you have sinned against a holy God. You have made choices. You have made sinful choices. And there are consequences for those, for those choices. The consequence is, is death, spiritual death, separation from God. A holy God who will not leave the guilty unpunished. That's the start of the gospel message. That's the bad news, right? That you are guilty because of your own choices, because of your own decisions. That there is a God who holds you accountable. And yes, there is forgiveness offered. There is freedom in Christ. But, but we must embrace this truth. The naive, the youth, they must know this. That their actions have consequences. That there are, there are consequences to their decisions. So that they will not stay youthy. So they will have discernment. And wisdom here is for the, the naive, for the youth, but also, verse 5, it's for the wise. The wise also find themselves having access to wisdom. And it tells us a, a thing or two about what it takes to become wise. If the wise are learners, as it says, they hear an increase in learning, then, then you can't be wise without being a learner, without being humble, without being teachable. The one who thinks they have arrived is not, in fact, wise. So the goal here in Proverbs is to make the wise even wiser, even more confident, more equipped for life. So wisdom's purpose here for the, the naive, prudence, for the youth, discretion, and here for the wise man, the one who has understanding. Into verse 5, he, this man, will acquire wise counsel. 
He will acquire wise counsel. This word, uh, you might read this and think, okay, he's going to have counselors, people to speak into his life. But really, this word wise counsel, it's actually one word in the Hebrew. And it's actually a word for uh, either for sailing or for military endeavors. It's actually a skill for sailing or a skill for military escapades. So he's saying he will acquire now a skill to navigate. Not to navigate the seas, not to navigate battle, but a, a skill to navigate life. Uh, growing up, uh, my family used to take a, an annual vacation to the beach. We'd go to San Diego every summer for a week. That was like our, our one family trip. And uh, we'd go to the beach all day, every day. But one day on the trip, my dad would always go to San Diego Bay, and he would rent a sailboat. And that was his favorite thing to do. I mean, might, it might have been because the sailboat's the cheapest boat to rent, has no motor, you're not paying for gas. But, but he thought of himself as a sailor. And, uh, and it was terrible because he didn't know how to sail. So I just remember this, being, being out in the bay, just tossed around by the wind, uh, one time capsizing in the water. And as I read this, as I was thinking about this, the, the wise man who has this, acquires wise counsel, acquires this ability to navigate the, the stormy seas of life, you could say. Not just the San Diego Bay, but the, the dark skies, the, the waves of life in the open ocean. And the wise man has the ability to navigate he is skilled. He, he can find north all the time through trials, through difficulties. So as you read the book of Proverbs, just consider the, the wise man. Consider the, the blessing here of wisdom, the one who is, who is teachable, the one who receives this instruction, now has this ability to navigate all of life. This is who gets wisdom. And as you read Proverbs, wisdom is pictured as a, a woman crying out, She's crying out in the street, making herself heard. She is not hard to find. She is available to all who would seek her. And that brings us to the, the fourth question here. Fourth question, where do I find wisdom? Where do I find it? Uh, obviously, God's word, all of God's word, all of scripture is God-breathed. All of it is useful. So you could say all, all of God's wisdom in this, in this book. Yes, that is true. But the book of Proverbs, specifically verse 6, Solomon again tells us how this wisdom comes in this book. He says, To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. So wisdom in this book comes through proverbs, through figures, through riddles, through these wise sayings. So this is where you find wisdom in this book, on the backside of all these truisms. You know, if you've spent time in this book, you've wrestled through these principles you look at them from all these different angles. You squeeze all the truth you can out of them as you make decisions. And it takes work to get there. But there, there is so much wisdom for every scenario in life in this book. To, to ask maybe a, a backward question, consider for a minute, what does Proverbs not teach us about? What kinds of topics does Proverbs not talk about? Maybe you're thinking medicine, Obviously, Proverbs doesn't tell us how to set a bone. Uh, Proverbs isn't going to tell you what time you should get up tomorrow. It's not going to say, should I wake up at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. tomorrow? It's not going to tell you, should I buy this house or this house? But it does tell us how to think about pain, how to think about sickness. It does tell us how to think about work, how to think about debt. It tells us how to think about laziness and sleep and discipline. Just consider Proverbs 6.10. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. That proverb will inform you what time you set your alarm tomorrow. It will instruct you. At least you'll have to think about that proverb as you're thinking about what time should I get up? How should I think about work tomorrow? And Proverbs doesn't tell you who to marry. It doesn't tell you where to find a spouse. But it, it sure says a lot about what to look for. Consider Proverbs 31. This Proverbs 31 woman, it says she rises while it is still night. She gives food to her household. Her lamp does not go out at night. So at the very least, young men, if you're looking for a spouse, at the very least, she should be a hard worker. Here in Proverbs 31, you see she works hard. She's not lazy. In Proverbs, it's not going to tell us uh, medical information. It's not a book of science. But, but it is going to tell us how to respond if you break your leg. It's going to tell us to seek counselors. 
It's going to tell us how to think about our responses. It's going to tell us our disposition we should have in trials, in discouragements. Proverbs isn't going to tell you which job to take, but it's going to tell you how to be a good worker. Think about Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. You see all the wisdom here for us in Proverbs. All of these different word pictures. All of these different truisms for for so much of life. Uh, Just a a different avenue of literature for us. It's so kind of the Lord to teach us this way. Different than the law, different than the prophets. Uh, I've heard it said that that you could boil marital conflict down to three areas. Three areas that that spouses fight most about. It would be intimacy, finances, and in-laws are the three things. You think about the book of Proverbs, you can, find, you can find answers, you can find truisms about these categories. So much more than that, about parenting, about work, about your finances, about decision making, about friendship, about fear and anxiety, about life, death, and eternity. There's so much in this book for us. So hopefully at this point, you're at a place where Solomon wants you to get. This is what he's driving at with all these purpose statements in the first six verses. Driving you to ask this this fifth question. How do I get wisdom? He's laid out all the value of wisdom here. Now the natural question, how do I get it? And we come to Proverbs 1-7, the the heartbeat of this book. Really the key to understanding this book. I think about the different movies that have a a treasure hunt. And usually a movie that has, there's a treasure map. There seems to always be a, a key that's needed to read this map. There's a cipher. There are clues on the map that you have to decipher. And just consider this book as a a map, like we talked about, a map for all of life. And you can think about Proverbs 1-7 as the the cipher, as the filter through which you have to read this book. Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It says the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of knowledge. Uh, Use p- parallel terms here. Knowledge, wisdom, instruction. These similar ideas. Taking God's truth and, and using it, applying it to life. And it all starts with the fear of the Lord. And this word beginning, when he says beginning, this is a word for a, a fountainhead. The starting point of a river. Do you think about this river wisdom? It flows out of fear of the Lord. You can't have any wisdom at all if you don't first fear the Lord. A fear of the Lord is an Old Testament expression for saving faith. Someone who is born again fears God. It's a reverential awe for God. To, to fear God is to recognize who he is, to recognize the truths about him, to submit to those truths, to agree with God that he is judge, that he is just. to to agree with God about his character and his justice, to acknowledge that you fall short of his holy standard, and to look to him as the solution, to cry out to him. That is the one who fears God. Charles Bridges says the, the fear of the Lord, he defines it this way, that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's law. He goes on to say, so that you would find his wrath so bitter, but his love so sweet. This fear of the Lord, it is a comfort to the believer. The the judge has become my friend, my savior. And John Murray says, the fear of the Lord is the soul, S-O-U-L, soul of holiness. The the fear of the Lord is what drives the believer to want to please God, to want to obey God. In every decision to, to think, what would God think about this? about this action, this response. It leads us to ask, what has he said about it? You see why this is absolutely necessary for wisdom, why we have to have the fear of God, this guiding principle for all of life. We have to ask the question, what does God say? We have to ask the question, is God pleased with this decision? I want to build my knowledge, I want to build my my bank of truth, so that I can walk in a way that pleases the Lord. That is the the right path toward wisdom. So how do you get wisdom? You must fear the Lord. So the goal of wisdom is not that you would know a bunch of facts, not that you would be book smart, 
But the goal of wisdom is that you would know God, that you would grow in your love and your trust and your affection for God. And there is hope in this verse, a promise. But verse 7 also contains a warning for us. There is a warning here in verse 7. Uh, I think about this verse as like the, the superhero movie. At the end of every superhero movie, you have the post credit scene. You know, after the, the heroes have won the day, there's the post credit scene, and there's always a, another villain. There's always evil lurking in the shadows. Well, here, even in this heartbeat verse of Proverbs, you have at the end the, the villain introduced. The fool. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Right on the heels of this explanation of wisdom is a warning. There's a danger for us. The, the fool, the one who has an aversion, a distaste for wisdom. I think the best description of the fool comes from Psalm 14, verse 1. Uh, you'll know this psalm well. It says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In his heart, he says, there is no God. That is the fool. He is a practical atheist. He might be in a pew on Sunday. He might not say that with his mouth, but in his heart, he is not a worshiper. His affections come from a place that is not concerned about what God thinks, about what God says. He does not fear God. He doesn't care about God's affection. The fool lives and acts like his actions don't have consequences. He does whatever will appease his own appetite. This is the fool. And he can't get wisdom because everything he does is right in his own eyes, Proverbs says. He doesn't see his need for wisdom. He, he doesn't fear God, so he is unconcerned with what God says. So we find out here that God fears, love wisdom, have this appetite for wisdom, and the fool has no appetite. He actually hates what God says. He despises wisdom. So you could say it this way, that the, the way you treat wisdom is the way you treat God. The way you deal with God's word is the way you deal with God. The, the fool doesn't care that God has spoken. He, he isn't concerned about God's instruction. And here in Proverbs 1, 7, Solomon drives us to a, a fork in the road. The Bible is always driving us to a decision, to an inflection point. Always asking, you, you must choose this day whom you will serve. Always there are only ever two paths, the, the wide path toward destruction and the narrow path leading to life. And here the path of wisdom and the path of folly. And Solomon's going to tell us where these paths end. Look at the end of chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. Proverbs 1.32, For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. The naive one who stays naive, it says it will kill them. The fool who loves his folly will be destroyed. There is destruction and death at the end of this path. But the one who listens, the wise one who increases in learning, verse 33, He who listens to me shall live securely. He will be at ease from the dread of evil. The, the one who listens, they will dwell securely. They will have protection. That, that is where this leads to. It leads to, to hope. You have, you have death on one side. You have life on the other side. And Proverbs 132 for me is, is one of the most haunting verses in the Bible. You might have different verses that are encouragements to you. Think about Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Romans 8, 28, these sweet truths that we cling to. Well, well Proverbs 1, 32 is that, that truth that, for me, keeps me up at night. Because look, look what it says about the fool. Look what it says destroys the fool. It says the complacency of fools will destroy them. A complacency, you could say the careless ease of the fool. To, to put it simply, the love of comfort. The fool is complacent. He is lazy. He loves his own comfort. If you do nothing, you will be foolish. If you are just complacent. Wisdom, it takes work. It takes discipline. It takes painful self-analysis. This humbling work of seeing your own weaknesses. Asking yourself hard questions. 
and the fool, he just wants to be comfortable. He just wants to enjoy life. You know, the biggest fear of the fool is a change to his comfortable circumstances. That is his biggest fear. And this is a haunting verse living in Gilbert, Arizona. It's the, one of the safest places in America. You know, Costco down the street, living in a culture that prizes comfort and ease. You know, we have Amazon Prime, DoorDash, all of these conveniences of life. And here we see that the fool just wants an easy life. All he wants is ease. That's all he looks for. But we find out in verse 33, the fool who wants the easy life will not find it. But the wise, the humble one, it says at the end of verse 33, look at how it ends. He will be at ease from the dread of evil. He is the one who finds himself at ease. And that's not to say he's without trials, without hardship. But it says without the dread of evil. Evil here being bad circumstances, hard things in life. The, the, the circumstances that happened to Job were called evil. So the, the wise one is not without those things, but he is without dread of those things. He is without fear. They live without fear because they are secure in the fear of the Lord. Oswald Chambers says, when you fear God, you fear nothing else. And when you don't fear God, you fear everything else. So the wise here will be secure in their soul. You know, they will still experience tragedy. They, they still go through storms and trials of life. But they walk through those storms with confidence. You know, they may walk through dark valleys, but, but they don't walk there alone. And imagine in every situation in life, having this security, having this confidence, like, like the boat captain that knows how to navigate dark waters. Imagine in every situation in life, having confidence which direction to go, never lacking conviction. You step into crisis. You step into tragedy. But you step into it without fear. You walk through all of life with a clean conscience. Not crippled by anxiety, but rock-solid confidence because you have this fixed standard in life. You have this solid rock. You have wisdom. God himself to direct you. And this is available to all those who fear the Lord. Confidence, security, without fear. And then that brings us, as we, as we close here, to this last, uh, last obvious question. A question that arises out of this. How do I get wisdom? Well, you have to fear the Lord. Well, how do I get the fear of the Lord? How do I get the fear of the Lord? Where does this come from? And Solomon tells us in the next chapter. It's so helpful for us. Look at Proverbs 2, verse 5. He says, Then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. He equates here fear of the Lord and knowledge of God. To know God is to fear him. As you grow in your, your knowledge of God's law and his character, your fear of him will grow. But he starts verse 5 with this statement, then. There is a condition here. You have to do something. Before you get this, this fear of the Lord, what must you do? Look at the first four verses of chapter 2. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, if you make your ear attentive to wisdom, and incline your heart to understanding. If you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord. So how does this come? How do you get the fear of the Lord? Through God's word. That's what he's driving at. Solomon here, as a, as a prophet, his words are God's word. He is writing scripture. How do you grow your fear of the Lord? through the Bible, through scripture. You have to know God's wisdom. You have to know what he says. This is how you grow your fear of the Lord. You grow your knowledge of God and then you will fear him. This is what the unbeliever needs. The unbeliever needs God's word. They need to be confronted with God's law and his requirement, his holy standard. This is what the believer needs. They need God's word for sanctification. This is what your children need. They need to hear God's word in order to build discernment. This is what Solomon is driving us at. Again, the, the purpose here, the goal tonight, that you would cling to God's word, that you would cling to wisdom, that you would say, this is the most prized possession that I have. I can't live without it. 
So that is my prayer tonight, that we would be people of this book. This means that God uses his word to, to sanctify his people, to equip us for all of life. Let me pray as we close and pray that God would make us this kind of people. God, I just thank you for the book of Proverbs. Thank you for your wisdom that comes to us in this, this unique form through these riddles, these sayings, these truisms, Lord. And thank you for revealing your purpose in all of it. Lord, that we would know wisdom so that we would know you. And the result of that, Lord, would be that we walk uh, in holiness. Our love for you grows, our fear of you grows, and we become a, a obedient people, a people that, that are lights in a dark world, Lord. So I pray that tonight the men and women, uh, children in here, would, would cling tighter to your truth. That this week we would be people of this book, that we would love your truth, Lord, and that would grow our fear and our love of you. I pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.